Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone. I'm Tim Erlen, and this is the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Uh, and today, I am joined by Jihanna Barrett, who is the CEO of Cybersuite, which offers cybersecurity consulting focused on small businesses and individuals. And she's also the founder of Tech Sorority. So we've got a lot of interesting things to talk about in there. Uh, welcome, Jihanna. Hi, thank you for having me, Tim. I'm super excited for you to be here and for this conversation. I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time on this podcast talking about cybersecurity and it's, you know, in relationship to large companies, um, some technical topics sometimes. Uh, and it often seems like cybersecurity is something that really large organizations and governments need to worry about. Uh, but your focus is is a little bit different there, and I, I think you you uh, have a, a clear opinion that cybersecurity is really something that, that the average consumer needs to think about as well. Is that right? Once you have a phone in your hand, you use an, a tablet, a TV, any smart device, or just your computer for anything, cybersecurity is a concern for the everyday person, 100%. And more and more... I mean, it's it's almost uh, you know silly to say it at this point, but more and more we spend our time involved with those devices, and so that's got to drive the cybersecurity concerns for those individuals, as you point out. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, right? Like your phone has so much information about you and other people. At that, half of the time you log into accounts from your phone, you pay for things from your phone, you contact and communicate with folks, and an assortment of you have pictures in there. And no one like takes the time to think that that information needs to be safeguarded as well. You lose your phone, for some people, that's like losing a lifeline. And so part of keeping it safe is taking into account cybersecurity. It is making sure your operating system is up to date on your device. It's updating your apps, things like that. You know, it's really interesting to, to think about this because when we talk about cybersecurity for uh, you know, a large organization for an enterprise, for a business, we're so often focused on, you know, how how they can operate their business securely, how they can accomplish whatever their mission as a business is and do so securely. But when you think about individuals, it, it's a slightly different perspective because you have to start thinking about yourself as having, you know, your life as being a mission that you want to to be able to carry out securely. And uh, it just, you're, 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 um, the way you put that there about uh, the things you have on your phone, the activities you undertake, that's really you, you know, living your life as a mission and being able to do so securely is sort of, you know, part of, of being able to do so uh, successfully. Absolutely. Part of, people don't understand the role that they play when it comes to cybersecurity. The biggest, I guess, vulnerability or threat to cybersecurity are people, right? Like, even when you think about the larger enterprise, your, your employees, the people have to be trained in order for any of these measures that you're putting in place to work. So if they have to do it for work, why wouldn't they do it for their personal situations? Why wouldn't you say, hey, it's my responsibility to make sure that I'm not um, leaving my airdrop on and possibly compromising, you know, my device or sending things to other devices it's important that I don't save my password directly to my device, but maybe use a password manager. It's things like that that are really important because people are the biggest threat to, to safety and security when it comes to technology. And organizations invest in training their people on cybersecurity all the time. I mean, if you're in any an organization of any size, you have some kind of ongoing requirement for basic cybersecurity awareness training. But wh why don't we do that for ourselves as individuals? It seems like it would be important. I think people are still, they, they still view the internet as some like mystical place, right? Like magic happens in the background. And for a lot of people who aren't in the tech space, they don't really understand the nuts and bolts behind how the internet works. So where they would 
have a, a sense of situational awareness for their physical safety in person. I don't necessarily think that they have fully grasped that same concept of safety and security when it comes to the internet. But I want to talk about that, the, the people in tech piece of that, because um, there was a point in time where people in tech or people in cybersecurity could understand sort of holistically how the internet worked. But I think with the increase in, in the complexity of, of what we would call the internet broadly, and with the increased specialization of people in technical roles, it's more and more likely that I understand just the piece of it I work on. And I'm, I'm just as, as ignorant as the, the average consumer on a lot of the aspects of how the, the internet and cybersecurity work because they're not a focus area. It's too complex. 100%. I am in cybersecurity and I am always fascinated by other people in cybersecurity that I meet that do something that I don't do, right? So yeah. for, for me, like, um, I started off in the Air Force working for NSA. So, I was doing more of the the pen testing type of role. So I understood that. And then I meet people who do compliance, who do like law and ethics. And I'm just like, wow, okay, well, I guess there was more to it than what I thought, right? So I do think that, yes, you're 100% right. We kind of focus on our niche within, especially cybersecurity, but that's why it's so important to have and normalize the conversation about how you use it in the day to day. Because even though we're super technical with what we do for work, it gets lost in translation sometimes when we need to apply it to our personal lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might have a really deep understanding of how DNS works across the internet, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you understand how mobile phone security, you know, uh, works. Yeah. 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 And I, I think there is a cultural component there of um, if you work in cybersecurity, y y there's a pressure to, to sort of behave as if you know about everything, uh, to have sort of to be that expert across the board and giving up on that that role of being the expert and acknowledging that there's there are things that you could learn that you're not the expertise, especially in sort of the consumer side. I think that's a tough cultural shift for people. Oh, I mean, honestly, one of the main questions that I get, even from people within the cybersecurity space or just tech in general, is why do I need to know cybersecurity for my day to day life? And I'm just like, are you joking? Like, um, and, and I guess it's because that's part of the reason why it became my mission. So this kind of me just taking this approach really came during the pandemic, right? So everyone is home and they are, on the internet, mom, dad, everyone, all day, every day. And I see hack after breach after breach after hack after this. And I, and everyone is just like, my money's missing. I didn't get my tax return. Like all of these things. And I, so then I literally went to social media and I just started taking what I knew and understood and telling and translating it to the masses. Like, hey, if your kid is on this particular game, it was just in the news. They had they had a data breach. You might want to reset passwords and do things like that. And the more that I did that, and and it was and it, it wasn't that there was anything new, right? The same things happened all the time, but it was repetition. That's how you learn anything. So it was me constantly reiterating: stay on top of your passwords, update your apps, doing little things like that. That before I knew it, people were messaging me saying. Hey, they didn't get me to click that email or that text message link because I knew you said don't don't click anything that I didn't expect to get or something like that. So I knew it was like starting to take root and mm -hmm. I couldn't let them down at that point. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned the, the, the news cycle around cyber attacks. And I think that's one of the, the areas worth talking about a little bit because, you know, there have been recently some high profile I mean, I, I, frankly, I could say that at almost any point in time, there have been recently high-profile cyber attacks in the news. But it seems like like they're continuing to escalate. But I, I definitely have the sense that, that people aren't really sure how, as an average consumer, an average person, they should view those cyber attacks. Do they relate to their own lives? Is there any impact to them, really? Or is this just something that, that you know makes headlines that they, they can read? So how do you have that conversation with folks about how the the large-scale cyber attacks really impact them as individuals? 
So the approach that I've been taking to kind of drive it home and and explain everything is I take something that for the most part people will know about. For example, last summer, Carnival Cruise Line, they had a huge data breach. It's summertime. Everyone's at least heard of a cruise. They might have vaguely known about Carnival, but I give them the what happened and the why they should care all the time. And then I give them like the pointers on what they can do. So what happened? Carnival Cruise Lines had a data breach, employee information, and some um, past passenger information is available. Why you should care. If you've used them before and you've maybe given them a credit card, check for any suspicious activity on that card. If you can't afford to, disable it, get a new card, or at least set up alerts so that you're aware if any suspicious activity does happen because you don't know where your information is at this point, right? If you are using the same passwords across different plat, um, different platforms, maybe you want to start using different platforms for, for different things so that access to them, if in case they're available in a breach, is siloed and is not, you know, you get one password, you get access to your whole life. Like things like that. And the more I did that and I explained why they should care, it really started to take root because you can't just say this happened again. What's going on in cyberspace has nothing to do with me. I just want to shop online and be great, right? But you have Mm -hmm. to understand that it's more than that. You go to school online, you work online, you shop online, and there's a lot of information about you available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and through the the pandemic, I think the 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 online interactions that we all have has have increased. You know, it's more ordering food, ordering groceries. You know, less visiting places in person, and all of that increases your your footprint as an individual and that that's got to increase your risk too. Absolutely. Instacart last year, everyone was ordering their groceries. You literally could not go into the supermarket because of the pandemic, right? So the place that you're using to go food shopping now has told you that they've had a data breach and your card information's out there. How do you handle that? What does that mean? What does that look like for you? So um, and even so, did you use a debit card or a credit card? Because those two things have drastically different impacts on, on your finances, on your life. So I think it was really important that I kind of just continue to reiterate the point. And, and it's been working. I can't complain. I think slowly but surely everybody's been catching on and becoming more aware. And that's what we should have because none of this is going to stop. Like technology is, is, speeding ahead by leaps and bounds right so if we can get the fundamentals down i think that will you know help improve the posture that we have now as far as security you are listening to the tripwire Cybersecurity podcast thousands of organizations rely on tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs why because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. The idea of, of focusing on fundamentals of sort of, you know, cybersecurity hygiene has a lot of a lot of appeal. If you if you do these basic things right, you decrease your risk. You know, just like if you brush and floss your teeth, you decrease your risk. For, you know, for uh, you know um, uh, tooth decay, like same kind of thing. But making sure that we understand what those fundamentals are, it seems like a a, a difficult challenge for you know to do that broadly for the average consumer seems like a challenge. Oh, 100%. We learn about physical safety and security from childhood, right? Like, look both ways before you cross the street. Hold your parents' hand. Like, you know, be careful of your surroundings. Don't, don't, we're, we're hearing it early. This, half of us are learning it. Think about the baby boomers who are learning how to text now. Like, this is not something that they've grown with, accustomed to. Um, children now maybe are early adopters and can probably handle security information a lot better than some of the adults now. So it, there is a huge learning curve, 
but it's a necessity at this point. It's not optional. Just the way, like I said, the way you would think about your physical security, you need to think about your cyber security as well. But how do we balance between, you know, being sort of good, good cybersecurity citizens and, you know, giving in to sort of fear? Like, how do you separate the fact from fiction? Because I think if you don't work in technology, and even in some cases, if you do work in technology, there's this perception that, you know, a cyber attacker can can do just about anything. And the reality is that, you know, there are limitations, uh, you know, in cyber attacks, just like there are in any other kind of, of uh, situation. Right. I think it's a healthy fear, right? Because like with anything, you if you have a healthy fear of it, you become more aware. It's not to say I, I tend to take their approach. It's not if it's going to happen, but when it happens, can you reduce the the level of impact it's going to have on whether it's your business or just disrupting your personal life, right? So yes, there's a lot of information and you don't want people out here hyper paranoid and now they want to be off the grid because I don't even know if that's feasible at this point. But I do think that if you're aware of what could happen and you do the at least the basics of, of how to help yourself, then, I, you know, you take a risk every time you get in a car, right? So you put on your seatbelt and you try to be as vigilant as you can. Can you still get in an accident when you get in the car? Absolutely. Can can you lose your life or, you know, something happen? Absolutely. But that's not the intention that you move with. You still move cautiously while you're operating that vehicle. It's the same concept with this. You hear about car crashes all the time, but that doesn't stop you from getting in the car and trying to get to your destination. Same Mm -hmm. thing with this. Hmm. That's interesting. I I mean, you make me think about the fact that we require people have a license in order to drive so that they can operate their vehicle safely. And while I I don't think I would go down the path of proposing that people need a a license to get online, the idea that there's some kind of basic uh, set of skills required in order to operate, you know, your phone or the computer safely, that's not a bad idea, you know, that we should all have sort of a, a, a base level of knowledge of how to keep ourselves safe online seems very reasonable. Absolutely. And like I said, fundamental. So I don't expect you to know how to implement a firewall and you're locking down your whole home network and, you know, like not at all, but changing your router from the default password on the back of it, that basic, you know, things like Mm -hmm. that. Like you're the administrator for this website, change the password from and username from admin admin to something else and a, and a eight to 16 digit password with unique characters, you know? So it it sounds like a lot, but that's because it's not our norm. Once it becomes yeah, yeah. normalized, I think we're, it'll be a completely different story. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Now, I, I want to change topics a little bit here because we, we started at the, you talked a little bit about how you got into cybersecurity. And I mentioned at the start that you're the, the founder of, of Tech Sorority. And I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about that that journey? What was Tech Sorority or what is Tech Sorority and and why did you start it? Right. So for me, Tech Sorority was everything that I needed when I started in my tech career. I, like I said, I started in the Air Force and I didn't see many women of color or women really there who had career paths that I can follow. I remember feeling very lost and, um, hope like kind of grasping at straws do i do the degree or do i do a cert like how do i get support studying for an exam and things like that and i remember always being the one woman on a team of men typically white males so mm-hmm. it was it was definitely different and i knew that i had the responsibility of representing both my gender and my race every time i showed up in addition to my skill set so I remember one time I went, I had attended an all girls Catholic school in Brooklyn, New York, and I went back for career day and I walk in the room and, and the, one of the girls say to me, oh no, this is for the person who's in tech. I don't, like, she didn't know where I, and I'm dressed up, I'm, you know, hair done, clicking my heels with a nice dress on. And I was like, no, I'm her. And they all look at me like, are you sure? Oh my God. And I literally had to change the conversation from what I was, what I do for a living to debunking the idea of what a woman in tech is. 
and basically help the girls understand that there is no stereotype of who a woman in tech is or what she looks like. And they they have a seat at that table just as much as I do, just as much as anyone coming before them did. And so tech sorority was kind of born out of all of those experiences. And it's just a community and I guess a, a sisterhood for us where we balance that fine dance between gathering because we all have this specialty of technology as our career choice, but we're still women and we bring our own essence and flavor to that industry. Yeah. So you, you talked about that in terms of, you used the past tense while you were talking about, uh, you know, sort of being the only woman of color in, in a room full of white men in these cases. But has that, has that really changed for you? I mean, it seems like, you know, in terms of representation in, in tech and cybersecurity, um, that's, that would still be the case today. It is changing. I know that there are more faces that look like mine popping up, but we're nowhere near it being equal. So I don't want to like not acknowledge who's there now and making amazing strides, but we, we definitely know it can be a little bit more balanced. Um, and I think creating organizations and spaces, and there's tons of them that, you know, highlight women in tech, but I think the more we continue to do this and normalize it and make it comfortable, I think we'll see more women in that space going mm-hmm. forward. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. You have this particular focus on small businesses, on individuals. And, you know, as we know, the representation in, in tech is it doesn't match up with with the reality of the world in terms of gender balance, in terms of, of race. So uh, are you providing, by being a woman of color and having this focus, are you providing a, a better interface for those individuals and those small businesses into cybersecurity? Is that an advantage for you in that that practice? I definitely think that I am using who I am and what I know to communicate to an audience that probably wouldn't have paid attention to it before. And so if, if, the, if, you know, if I can continue to do that, then I will, because I do think that majority of my audience doesn't even, especially the business owners who are the most vulnerable, but the least protected, they need it. Right. So they think that only big companies, and I often explain your targeting practice for the big companies, right? Like the cyber criminal starts off practicing on your business. What don't you do before they go for the big guy? And can you as a small business owner afford to not have that, uh, have a plan in place? Because the thing is, once they knock you offline and your business goes under, can you bounce back from it? You're not necessarily the target, at least not yet, right? Who has a whole can hire a whole team to get them back on track. You lose brand reputation, you lose revenue, your systems or operations are impacted. There's so many things. So I really just try to communicate that as effectively as I can to, to business owners and for the everyday person, like I said, just driving that point home using things that they can relate to. So I think it coming from me, me being who I am and how I look and what I represent definitely helps get that message across. I always like to, in these conversations, um, try and get to, you know, some practical advice for folks. Um, so we've talked a, a lot about, you know, the, the responsibility we have as individuals uh, for cybersecurity in our personal lives. And I think you've, you've mentioned a couple of things that people can do, but what are the, the top sort of practical tips that you have for people in terms of improving their their own sort of personal cybersecurity hygiene? Sure. Um, so the main one that I harp on that my, so the community of people that I talk to about cybersecurity, I call them my cyber tribe. So I'll say, hey, cyber tribe, like we're talking about passwords again, right? That is literally the keys to your digital identity. So that should be the first place that you start working on and start working with. 
I tell them obviously about how to create a good password, but taking all the guesswork out of it, get a password manager. That's the first thing that you can do. It helps you create the password. It helps you store the password. It prevents you from logging it in, typing it in directly. All of the guesswork can store your card information, your billing information. And granted, I'm not saying any company is above being hacked, but this is what they specialize in. So when they focus on something, they definitely take the measures that they need to do to secure it, right? So that's the first thing I would suggest. Get a password manager. When you're shopping online, make sure that that website is a secure website. It shouldn't just say HTTP, but it should say HTTPS so that you know that it is now an encrypted site so that when you're entering your card information, it's not something that is flowing over clear text over the internet that anybody who has a scanner nearby can read, things like that. Um, I would also recommend... For social media, be mindful of what you post. Don't post in real time. You know, you give a lot of information about yourself away on social media. So it'll be really um, wise of you to be, you know, conscious of that and say, hey, like, I'm going to post this later, but I was here or this is what you think about it. If you wanted to reset someone's password, the security questions that are typically asked on that platform Someone can probably find out from you about face um through your social media. They can go on your Facebook, your 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 Instagram and say, "Okay, well this is her favorite place to visit. This is her date of birth. This is the year they got they they got married." And so now the security question is, "When was your anniversary?" and I can easily go to your social media, type it in and possibly reset your password, locking you out of your account. So things like that are some of the tidbits that I suggest. Good. That's helpful. That's great. Unfortunately, I think we're, we've we've hit our, our our time limit on this conversation. I, I, we could keep talking for a long time. It's super interesting. Um, so, Jihanna, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, I found it really interesting and educational. Um, so, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Tim. Thank you for having me. This is great. I had a good time. And for everyone who was listening, I hope it was a, a good episode for you, and that you tune in for the the next one. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.